effects that gives technological changes. But see, you say natural selection powerful. is a weak force. Weak force compared to what? It's a weak force compared to the force of human cultural change, which has this Lamarckian push that whatever we invent in one generation, we pass on directly to the next. Natural selection continues to operate in humans. It probably operates with the same speed it always did, but that's too slow to amount to anything. Also, there's a, another misconception built into that, and that is the notion that natural selection is usually leading a species somewhere. Humans have been stable for at least 50,000 years. The people who painted those caves in Chauvet 30,000 years ago were us, and the beauty of the art speaks to that directly, even though we know the bones and the brain size also tell us these are us. But that's what you expect. Large species tend to be highly stable. The changes that occur in Homo sapiens are local and fluctuating. They go back and forth. That's what natural selection usually does. Natural selection rarely is leading an entire species in some progression aggressive or general direction. The natural history of most species during most of the time is to be stable, and that's what natural selection is doing to us now. The directional forces in human history are all the result of this powerful and different force of cultural change. But we're not under uh, that kind of evolutionary pressure right now, you say. We're, we're, we're somewhere in the, in the uh, stability run which is the standard situation for most highly successful, stable, worldwide species. That's only talking about our biological nature. That's what I say when yes. you talk about the differences between Yanomami and Finns and all of us. You can't attribute that to evolutionarily established disparities because it's all a result of the different potentialities of a common genetic heritage. We've been stable for that long, but we are a very unstable and rapidly changing species, but not for reasons of Darwinian natural selection and altering mm -hmm. genetic biology. We're unstable and unpredictable because we've unleashed this new and different force of cultural change, which is not genetic and which doesn't follow the same slow and steady rules of Darwinian natural selection. Steve, I want to, when we come back, 1-800-423-TALK or join us online at theconnection.org. Stephen J. Gould, we won't go back over the Yanomami argument and what, if anything, made them fierce. The thing we still want to figure out, though, is what makes the anthropologists so fierce around this subject of genetic determinism, also about the direction of evolution, whether it's upward toward man or just sort of across uh, into chaos. But... Uh, come How down. about neither? Just not upward anywhere, but ordered by its topology of the tree of life. Whatever that is. Go back, it's, just go back, and when you look uh, out there, uh, even probably into your mailbag, and see the, the red-hot uh, passion in this argument around who made us, what made us, what makes us the way we are, uh, how do you sort out the categories? Who's right, who's wrong? Oh, first of all, you have to understand why the passion is so high, and I think that goes back to a famous statement by Freud who said that the truly great revolutions are the ones that disturb our own sense of what we once arrogantly took to be our self-importance. And there have been two great revolutions. The first was uh, the Galileo and Copernicus's, and the second was Darwin's. Now, we know how tumultuous the first one was. We know what happened to Galileo, but, you know, that was only about real estate. That was about whether we're on the central body of the universe or peripherally somewhere. The Darwinian revolution is the big one because that's about essence. That's about who we are and what we're related to. So that it should be so passionate is in some sense not surprising. And of course, people are always looking, I think, in large degree inappropriately to science for an answer to questions that trouble them about themselves and their own species. Clearly, there are many things about our behaviors and our histories that either we don't like or that puzzle us. After all, this is a veil of tears, and we've known since the Book of Job that uh, very bad things happen to very good people, and uh, those questions are not soluble, and we seek to solve them through uh, this powerful mechanism of science. So it might occur to some people, well, maybe we can solve them because we're actually made that way. Maybe we're made not to 
behave in ways that would make this life better for all of us. Maybe we should accept it because it's an evolutionary inevitability, or maybe we shouldn't accept it, but at least understand that it's an evolutionary inevitability, and then maybe we can learn to manipulate it. To me, those are very simplistic answers. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to get the answer to any kind of moral question, certainly not that one, from scientific factuality. I'm afraid I feel the best we can do from evolutionary theory is to learn what we all share in common as members of a single species, as all humans are. And the best we're going to learn is that we have some very broad, evolutionarily-based behavioral, behavioral predispositions, which are enormously modifiable by cultural differences and cultural change. We're not going to get the answer to what we don't like about ourselves. It's not going to be directly programmed out of our evolutionary biology. But d does that explain why when people find in the Yanomami, uh, or, or they say they find, uh, the kind of fierce fighting heritage that we all, all humans, learned on the in the evolutionary plane of uh, East Africa, uh, the argument is suddenly life and death, and, and uh, you know, great reputations are uh, at stake here in that fight. First, yeah, first of all, I'm not even sure it's true about that one particular group in South America, but even if it were, there are hundreds of human groups with as broad a range of culturally set behaviors on that particular issue as we have within our own culture today in the United States. So I, there's no one group, whatever it does, that either specifies the basic genetic biology of the entire species Homo sapiens or tells us what evolution has made us. Deal with another argument, this the, sort of the direction, no direction argument that comes up a lot on this program. Um, Robert Wright's argument is that uh, w without evolution necessarily being uh, purposely guided by a creator, it does favor a certain kind of communicative, cooperative uh, activity at the level of the slug or at the level of Homo sapiens. You take to tend to he he takes the view that over you know if if the world were wiped out and started again, in in, in a few many billions of years, we'd come back to it something very like a human being because uh, the process favors the selection of kinds of uh, social beings you know, like us. You, you, you tend to say it wouldn't happen. It's such a curious argument when you think of it. Life has been on this planet for three and a half billion years. There is one species which is one out of 200 species of primates, which are a minor order within a group called the mammals that comprise 4,000 species, which are a minor group within the vertebrates, which comprise 40,000 species, which are themselves a minor group among the animals, because if you want to designate any group as most successful, it's surely the insects with more than a million described species, who are themselves a small group with respect to the truly dominant forms of life on this planet, which are bacteria. Mm -hmm. If there is, therefore, a clear and necessary direction and if it leads to the kind of social cohesiveness embodied in human systems, then why one species on the one planet we know where it happened? I would expect to see it as a multiple parallel trend pervading the history of life, and I don't. I see it as the curious, albeit glorious and wondrous invention of one peculiar little lineage. That, to me, does not speak to inevitability. Except uh, people of his... Well, lots of others, too, would say uh, these things do. Uh, I mean, the eye has evolved many times. Not every eye on an insect or a human or a mouse uh, comes from the same original accident. There have been many starts toward that end.